Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Me Anything session on EMBO's Global Investigator Network, or GIN. Today's webinar is part of India Biosciences International Brand Awareness Program, or IGAP. We are joined by three wonderful speakers today who will share their different perspectives on EMBO's GIN scheme. On the right hand side, you see the team behind today's session. I am Zilli Alam, and I will be the host for today. My colleague at India Biosciences, Suchi Prita, is the co host, and Shantala will be moderating the second half of the session. To begin with, I will launch a quick audience poll to understand our audience. You should be able to see the poll now. So this poll is for us to understand who is our audience. Okay, so now I am ending the poll. You will be able to see the results of the poll on your screen. So we have a fair uh, number of you, majority of you from South India. Uh, we also have people joining us from North, uh, North India and East and West zones. We also have 11% of you joining from outside India. In terms of career stage, uh, most of you, 47, uh, nearly half of you, 47% uh, are YIs uh, or assistant professors. So uh, basically, uh, you're the ones who are currently like the target group for today's uh, discussion. We also have a few research managers with us and postdoctoral fellows and uh, PhD students. We hope uh, you find this uh, discussion useful. In terms of uh, eligibility and uh, applying to the screen, uh, I see that most of you, around 53% of you, plan to apply for EMBO's GIN scheme in future. So uh, we hope that you find this discussion useful. And I'm going to stop sharing the poll. So just an overview about today's Ask Me Anything session. We will begin with an, uh, a quick overview about IGAP or International Grants Awareness Program, followed by uh, messages from EMBO. And thereafter, we will hear the stories and journeys of two successful awardees of Global Investigator Network. The second half of uh, today's session will be a long uh, question and answer session, wherein you will get an opportunity to ask questions uh, about uh, the application process and get clarity about uh, the specifics of GIN's application and other aspects. I request you all to keep posting your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, we will be using the chat box to share relevant resources with you. So do keep an eye uh, on the chat box throughout the session. With this, uh, I am going to hand over uh, to Shantala, who will give a quick overview of IGAP. Shantala, over to you. Thank you, Zile. Um, a very warm, well, is my audio clear for starters? Yes, yes. Thanks, Zile. So a very warm welcome from India Bioscience to everyone who's joining in today's uh, Ask Me Anything session. And um, a welcome to Gurlin, uh, Sunil, and uh, Jyoti as well. So just, I'm not gonna talk for too long and keep you from the main topic of today's webinar. Uh, just I briefly wanted to tell you a little bit about IGAP and specifically how it could benefit those of you who are applying for the GIN scheme this year. So IGAP was set up in late 2019 by India Bioscience with the hope to improve the quality and quantity of applications going out from India towards international funding opportunities because there's a big plethora of opportunities that are now open to Indian researchers. And so what we try to do is we try to work towards this by creating a lot of resources. Um, you can see that there's a link on your page. These are links will also be shared via the chat box um, with you. And so we try to put out resources in the form of webinars as in today's podcasts, articles, interviews, workshops, um, when the situation permits, possibly even in-person workshops on the different funding schemes that are available. And so far we have focused, we have covered three funding schemes in quite a lot of depth. And those are the schemes by EMBO, the schemes by HFSP and the schemes by the Mary Curie Foundation. And uh, so what we try to do in all these schemes to kind of make them the most um, useful or the most uh, helpful for prospective applicants is we try to expose the prospective applicants to the perspective of the funding agency, 
to reviewers, people who review these applications, as well as to inspire and give tips um, by, by having them interact with um, successful Indian awardees. So in today's session, you see we have two, of the, two out of three of these. So we have uh, Gerlind from EMBO and we have Sunil and Jyoti who are both uh, EMBO Gen awardees. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, thank you. So very quickly before I hand it, I hand it over um, to the speakers. Here on the screen, you will see these are a few resources that we thought would be relevant for you in the last mile of your application towards the Embogen scheme. So we have a webinar which we conducted last year, which con which talks about all the schemes that EMBO has for Indian investigators. Uh, so you have the YIP and the JIN. Do have a look at this. Gerland was a part of that session as well. We also have um, a detailed interview with Dimple Natani from NCBS, who is an EMBO JIN awardee as well. We also have some re resources related to EMBO YIP, which could also give you some pointers in your uh, application process for Embogen. So we have an article where we talked with Arun Shukla and ten, his 10 pointers for the last mile of the application process for Embogen, as well as a conversation with Minat Sirachadin. And the poster that you will see is on your screen is the way we compile these resources. So we take all these different resources that we have, we link them into a poster which is available for download. So if you ever want to have information, all the information that we have created and curated on EMBO schemes at your fingertips, please do download these posters from the IGAP website. And I believe the link must have been shared with you on your screen. So with that, I am going to now um, stop talking and hand it over to Gerlin. Uh, so a very warm welcome to Gerlin. Gerlin Valon, she's the deputy director at EMBO and has been a consistent support and a friend of India Bioscience in our journey to spread awareness and resources on international grants. And she's going to tell you a little bit about the EMBOGEN program. So over to you, Gerlin. Thank you, Shantala. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Sure. Second, so. everything okay? You can see my screen, right? Yes, and we can me. see your screen okay. and we can hear you as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all for this session. And I would like to thank India Bioscience for organizing for organizing this information session. I think this is very important that, that people learn early on how to write a, a successful application that they can also speak with successful applicants and, and, and with managers. It's really exactly what India Bioscience is doing. And of course, I would like to thank uh, Jyoti and Sunil for taking the time to, to also promoting the program and helping you in your application. So before uh, talking about the uh, Global Investigative Network, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about EMBO and why we are involved uh, in, in, in India. Because EMBO, the E stands for the European, the European Life Sciences Organization, which has, is composed of 1800 leading life scientists who have been elected into membership by their peers. But we not only have members in Europe, but we have members worldwide, and of course also members in India. And so here you see uh, the four current uh, EMBO members in India. And I just would like to point out that of course also Venki Ramakrishnan from the LMB in Cambridge, a Nobel laureate from 2009 and an Indian native. So of course also a member and a very engaged member of EMBO. Um, EMBO uh, uh, provides funding for training and scientists at different career stages. And I'll, I'll get into uh, uh, that a little bit more in a few seconds. Um, and it receives its funding via the intergovernmental organization EMBC. So here you see the 13 European member states of the EMBC. But we're not, as I said earlier, not only restricted to Europe, but um, we also have associate member states who contribute towards the funding of the different programs. So our largest associate member state is India, and uh, we also have uh, Singapore, Taiwan, and Chile currently, and we're uh, looking uh, negotiating with other uh, countries as well. So this means that all uh, scientists in our associate member states have full access to EMBO's programs. And this is why we're here and this is uh, uh, um, why we're looking forward to working with you. 
Um, in terms of programs, uh, I just would like to go through this very quickly. Um, there are the EMBO courses and workshops. We fund the organization of 90 scientific meetings per year. Well, that's in a normal non-COVID year. Um, and um, some of these actually also take place here in India, and we're looking forward to receiving applications for, uh, for meetings to, uh, here in India. Um, we have the EMBO fellowships, which come in two flavors. There are the postdoctoral fellowships, um, normal two-year postdoctoral fellowships, and the EMBO short-term fellowships for short-term exchanges. Um, I will say a little bit more about the lab leadership courses when I talk about the Global Investigator Network. And um, so now as a larger context is the EMBO Young Investigator Network, which consists of three programs, the EMBO Investigators, the EMBO Young Investigators, the EMBO Installation Grantees, which I will not mention because that is a bespoke program uh, in Europe. And then, of course, the EMBO Global Investigators, which is the topic of this uh, discussion today. So let me just quickly introduce the five global investigators in India. The program is very new, hence there are only very few members so far. So, um, and here you see, you know, as discussions, you have uh, Jyoti and Sunil. Um, so what is the goal of the Global Investigator Network? I guess the obvious goal is to link young group leaders in associate member states with, uh, with scientists in Europe. And the secondary goal, and well, I wouldn't even say it's a secondary goal, is to create and create, help our member states to create a young investigator, a network of young group leaders in the individual in the individual member states. And I'll tell you in a second how we would like to achieve that. So, um, you know, one thing, of course, is that uh, the global investigators participate in all the young investigator activities that we organize throughout the year, and I'll, I'll name a few later. Um, but we also provide benefits to the global investigators to network within the country. And, and um, let me specify this in a, in, in, in a few seconds. So as a global investigator, you receive um, an initial grant of 7,000 euros per year to cover travel accommodation and other expenses. For example, if you want to visit another research institution to give a scientific seminar, you can pay, pay for that. Or you invite a researcher, your favorite researchers, to give a scientific lecture at your institute to benefit your institute and your students directly. Uh, you can send group members to another laboratory to carry out experiments, you know, the crucial experiment for which you do not have your uh, you, do, you do not have the equipment at, at your institute, you can send them to collaborators in, the, in, the, in Europe, in the US, wherever. Um, you, uh, you can use these funds to organize joint group meetings with other laboratories in your home country, in India, uh, to create a network of scientists working in plant biology or structural biology, etc. You can attend and organize regional or, or international scientific meetings. Um, the funds cover for a lab retreat, which might, you might want to do to uh, discuss the, work, the, the direction your lab is going to take in the future, um, childcare support, etc. So I'm not going to Name, name everything here. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is the opportunity to um, get money, you know, get funds to organize regional meetings. And that's not only you know, the five global investigators that are in, in India, but with this we mean really Indian scientists that are, you know, young group leaders and others, of course, um, who are relevant for your particular research area, so that, that really networks within the countries are formed and supported by this activity. Um, just in terms of interactions with the European scientists, um, we have a couple of annual meetings. There's the annual Young Investigator meeting, which this year, unfortunately, will take place virtually, as pretty much anything yet now. We have uh, sectoral meetings. So, uh, scientists uh, from the network that are specialized in particular areas with microbiology, structural biology, RNA, blah, blah, whatever. We have 14 different groups that meet annually or biannually and discuss their science. The special thing about these sectoral meetings, you might say, well, there's enough conferences, right? So the special thing about these sectoral meetings is that you can 
you would be discussing data that you haven't published yet there where you have doubts that you would like to discuss with competent people who you trust to give you advice on so so that's what makes the sexual meetings actually special and uh, every two years we have something that we call a retreat which actually is a training is one week of of, of seminars and training etc and um one part uh, um, of the type of training that we also do at the lab retreat is uh, lab leadership uh, courses. These actually were developed for the young investigators in 2005 or so and have hence become uh, uh, widely available. And here, you know, they were based on the realization that as scientists, we are pretty well trained in our specific science, but we're not trained in leading a group of people, which is essential once you become a group leader. So um, fortunately, also, these are skills that can be learned, and that's what the lab leadership courses deal with. So how do you communicate? Communicate, I mean, how do you give constructive feedback to your students so you don't slam them on the floor and nothing is going, and you're not developing your people? Um, we talk about team development. You learn about conflict solving strategy, leadership skills. So, so all these things are, are taught in this lab leadership courses. And the nice thing is now that um, they are also coming to India. So together with the uh, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance, we will be running four courses this year. And I think also four courses next year. So for the moment, obviously, they are also online. So um, please keep an eye out if you're interested in this uh, to apply for one of these courses. Um, Yes, and I think that was it. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions later, and I'd like to hand back to Shantala. Thank you. Thank you, Gurlin. That's really informative. I will now invite Jyoti, who is a, a staff scientist at NIPG, to share her thesis and advice as an awardee. Over to you, Jyoti. Okay. So good evening, everybody. I'm Jyoti. I'm working at the National Institute of Plant Gen uh, Genome Research in Delhi. And today I'll tell you my experience of how the gene application was. Uh, apart from what uh, Jarlene told in the beginning of what, what the EMBO gene uh, funds you, uh, we'll, I'll, before I go to my personal experience, I'll just briefly take you through the eligibility. You know, it's for group leaders who have uh, at least one to six years of starting their own laboratory. So the embogen is targeted for them. And uh, for female candidates, there's an extra year, uh, you know, per child uh, for this uh, limit of application. And uh, I have to say, when I saw the ad in uh, Twitter in 2019, the first call of Jin, uh, uh, this, this is one point that really stuck me and I, I thought, Okay, this is great that you know there is this additional advantage for women in science. Uh, the, the most important thing for the gene is to have an excellent track record, and this track record means publications, independent grants, and a fully functional lab. And you should have published at least one senior author research paper in a uh, in a journal, or at least which is in a preprint version, and have uh, should have obtained sufficient funding to run the laboratory. And, uh, and you can only apply once uh, uh, for this program. Now I'll take you through my journey and at what time, just to show you what time I applied in. I joined at NIPGR in 2014 and I applied in, uh, you know, uh, in 2019 for the first call of Gene. Prior to that, I was in Germany for many years uh, for my PhD and postdoc. And it was quite natural for me to apply for the Embogen because there were already a lot of collaborators whom I wanted to continue in my scientific journey. So when I applied in 2019, this was before COVID era, the pre-selection results were pretty quick. And there is a selection committee which uh, judges your first application. Uh, and in mid-July, we got the results for that. And uh, you know, I was called for an interview, which was a physical interview in 2009 in November. And I started my gene program in January, 2020. So from what I hear, saw, saw in the application that you, uh, from the many application, they select 20 people for the interview. And so far I see that, you know, half of them or at least nine are selected for the gene program all through or in all these four uh, member states. So <clears throat> you have to really think, uh, you know, you have one chance and it can be any time between one to six years or seven years. 
and uh, if, uh, you know so it, it's important that you fix that uh, find that right time for yourself to apply so the application form apart from cv and the regular things uh, tells you to list your primary research publication that includes manuscripts which are either in submission or preprint version uh, so and publications arising from independent laboratory as a corresponding author that you have to list and publications arising from your postdoctoral and PhD work. So the, uh, before the interview, they again give you a chance if, if your paper is in a submission or preprint and there has been any progress on, the, on this. So before the interview, they give you a chance to update your CV basically. And uh, there's also a section where you have to list your three best publications. Uh, the best publication may not be the one with the be you know, highest impact factor, but it at least, you know, it, if it has a, a consistent research theme, I had listed three such uh, publication, which, uh, you know, dealt with my journey, uh, my scientific journey. And, uh, and I had provided these best publications and a brief explanation of why you chose them as your best publication. Then there's a section in the in your application where you have to uh, tell your research vision. And according to me, that is the most important part of your application. It, it tells you what uh, where you stand in the research and how, how is your work uh, relevant to what is going on world over and how do you see your work uh, progress five, five years down the line? What is the direction that your lab wants to focus on? And this is something I think you have to write with utmost, uh, utmost uh, you know, care. And uh, it's uh, just two pages, but you know, it, it describes your research theme and future directions. There is also a fourth point that is the letter of recommendation. So I uh, three, which has to be submitted online by the referees themselves. So please activate them in advance because you know, the people are all people are busy these days. Make sure your referees submit it. For my case, it was my PhD postdoc supervisor and my institute director. Now, as I told you, the research vision is, according to me, very important in this application. It's important to understand that the Embogen, with Embogen, you can collaborate with anyone in Europe. You don't need to list them in your application. I mean, you know, you don't need to tell that I'm going to uh, collaborate with this and this person right at the application process. So it's really, open, you know, it's up to you to find, you can find it out during your course of this program as well. And um, uh, for me, my research vision was based on, on the, uh, my best work at that point of time in 2019. And we are working on calcium channels, the CNGC channels. And uh, what I had written in my research vision was to understand how plants sense insect herbivory and how these calcium channels are responsible for producing the calcium fluxes, which are produced in plants and which warn them against insect attack. So this was just a brief outline that I wrote. This is the fundamental question that I'm asking. How is it that the plant is generating this calcium elevation? And to, to, understand, and to do that, I would need a lot of uh, you know, interdisciplinary uh, research, uh, which involves genetic screens, electrophysiology, uh, protein structural studies for which such a collaboration is crucial. Yeah, so this, this, this should come out in your research vision as to why you specifically want to have this program. As I told you, we had a physical interview. So once your um, application is shortlisted and you are that 20 person, you know, uh, who is shortlisted, you will be uh, called to present for a 10 minute presentation, summarizing your current projects and, uh, what, and followed by a 10 minute of discussion. Uh, so uh, we had it in this uh, rooftop launch in the EMBO uh, headquarters in Heidelberg. <coughs> And I suggest you stick to your time, 10 minute presentation and 10 minute uh, yeah, discussion can be longer, but your presentation, you should stick to that time. We had a physical meeting and there were five to six members in the EMBO in, uh, in, in my panel. I think there were two to three panels and in mine, there were so many. So there was one plant biologist on the committee and there were at least two of them who work on iron channels. Uh, so there were a lot of questions uh, on, on, on the field that I was working on um, and uh, specifically on uh, also on calcium channels and uh, how, what is their role in uh, plant, uh, plant stress uh, sensing. 
so the board was very well prepared and you know and asked many or such questions so other than that what i remember the question that i really enjoyed uh, you know answering a lot is they asked me who are your competitors worldwide now if you you know you are starting a, your six years in developing your own group now who is your biggest competitor worldwide so i listed these two big labs which were my biggest competitors and then they asked me how would your lab compete with him or her in long term so be honest so i was uh, you know i knew that you know i had to um, find a way that i find my own space and uh, because these were big labs that i'm competing with so and how do i my lab stand out with the in the work that they are doing so this i i think i i could answer it to the best of my abilities the next one was on my relations to the uh, my past post doctoral institution which was the max planck institute for chemical ecology as to why i still want to you know collaborate with them i have studied there for a long time so um, you know there was this was the only institute i think in the whole world which studies plant insect interactions in so much detail and i could i was able to explain why i still want to maintain a collaboration with them and uh, continue doing that with them for fellowship apart from other people whom i want to collaborate so you really need to have uh, need to have you know the, those focus areas which uh, which you you know you want to collaborate because you are going to be asked that during the interview so my interview was uh, i <clears throat> focus my interview into uh, because i was a plant biologist and i thought there are not many plant biologists in the committee so i had two slides which introduce my area of research in general and then a slide on what is the research focus outside this big uh, in, uh, plant insect interaction now this is my research focus calcium signaling and channels and then i had six slides where i um, explained about the latest research story so i picked up only one paper which was my best paper and i, I thoroughly explained that in if, how in the way possible in the six slides and then i had five slides for open questions and future direction of the lab so what is it i want to do from from here on so i had an equal number of slides for that and one slide for why i want an embo funding and what do i want to gain for it so basically interdisciplinary research and to foster existing and future collaboration and i also made sure in my thank you slide to to put the fact that we have already an experience with international funding my lab has been funded by the max planck india partner group for chemical ecology and which really helped me in setting up a lab at nipgr and that i want to continue this uh, you know international collaborations with the embogen as well so uh, this is just about the application process so uh, unfortunately because of covid there were a lot of things we couldn't uh, do a lot uh, none of the travels was possible and but what i have been using is the grants now is uh, used for covid relief grants which is bridging grants for students uh, that they have to support postdoc and phd students uh, they had it for this last two years to support us there is amazing manuscript editing services i could attend online meetings leadership courses and also lab management courses and for me also child care funding which they are providing is really great so i expect in future to use it more also for traveling and networking and i what i found very good with this fellowship it is it's a bottom up approach you you they really listen to your genuine concerns whether it is in the how the grants are being received and different aspects so you can always feel free to contact them so the embo gin in end is not about giving a lot of money to your lab to do your uh, you know uh, research it's about um, building your research profile by facilitating networking and collaboration with uh, you know the labs in europe so it's more uh, that kind of a uh, grant which will help you build up that research profile mm -hmm. so with that i want to thank you and um, yeah i'm always uh, uh, free to answer questions you might have if you can also email me for that thank you thank you jyoti for yeah. sharing your experience with such minute details now we have among us uh, sunil lakshman who is from instem bangalore and who will also share his experience about the embogen uh, application process over to you shunil yeah hi so um, i decided not to do many slides because i knew i was speaking after girland and jyoti and <laughs> as expected they did a comprehensive thorough job on uh, 
almost everything you need to know about the process of uh, the gin. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things um, on the GIN program and a growing realization that it is one of the best things I have done so far in my scientific career. So my science career has been a complete random walk. I did all kinds of things and somehow ended up here as a faculty member. Even, you know, the areas I worked on kept changing and this has continued even with my work. So I started my lab kind of end of 2014, beginning of 2015. So that's, uh, uh, and at the time I applied for the global investigative program, my lab was a little over five years old. Now, when I uh, uh, initially started, at least for the first few years of my research lab, I had a very poor knowledge of EMBO because most of my training was not in Europe. Now I knew the EMBO publications very well, all the journals, but I knew nothing else about the organization. Uh, I heard about the GIN program and the Young Investigator program from a couple of colleagues of mine here who happened to have uh, become a Young Investigator or a Global Investigator, uh, a Young Investigator first. I didn't at the time, so this was about uh, 2018, uh, understand the whole scale and scope of the fellowship, but I did apply for the Young Investigator program after three years of starting my lab. At that time, um, we hadn't actually published that much, even though we had dozens of projects off the ground, we only had a free printout. So I did interview for the Young Investigator program, but didn't get it because I was not able to convince the reviewers of the whole scale of what we were setting out to do at that time. Uh, so then I waited two years and I actually understood more about the program and the fellowships. And uh, around year five, when uh, I applied for the GIN, in those two years, we had published about a uh, uh, dozen papers. So we were much, much more competitive when we applied, when I applied for the Global Investigator Program. And at that time, uh, the process was exactly as Jyoti beautifully mentioned in uh, quite detail. Uh, I was able to quite clearly articulate uh, our vision. And most of my interview was focused on me talking about our vision and the breadth of the programs we are uh, addressing because what we do in our lab scales from molecules to molecular mechanisms to systems level analysis of metabolism. So it's a very broad kind of an area. But that went well because at least at the time um, I applied, I had, uh, we had been able to quite strongly establish our own uh, research. So one little take home though was this uh, 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 in the interview, the format is quite different and it was uh, quite nice to be able to talk more about uh, the vision of the program you're envisaging in the coming years of your research. Um, a few thoughts about the program itself. Uh, also while applying, you know, the recommendation thing that Jyoti mentioned, it, it doesn't only mean you get a reference from your postdoctoral advisor or your director, it can be anyone able to comment on your research. In my case, all my referees were not my past mentors. My postdoctoral mentor was still there, but I had two uh, people who were entirely independent referees who were familiar with my research and who knew me slightly because of my research, but not, not, uh, uh, not a personal direct mentor. So that also works. Uh, a few very nice things about the EMBO Global Program. First of all, it uh, connects you to a very large world of uh, really wonderful young investigators in Europe and other parts of the world. So the, the, the network is really wonderful, especially if, um, if you are a person, you know, we are all in remote locations and many of us, for example, I don't travel or network a lot at conferences, but this automatically connected me to a wonderful network. Uh, through this network, uh, as Gerlin mentioned, it is part of the ideas also to bring together researchers. So for example, now, after getting this fellowship, I was connected to another uh, investigator in Chile and we've started talking about a much larger possible collaboration. So that's really, really nice. Another very nice thing about the program is the kinds of things that EMBO offers. EMBO offers this tremendous amount of different things. There are these fantastic courses you could participate in. The fellowship allows you to send a person or, or people to another lab to complete experiments. Now, because of COVID, nobody's going anywhere. 
but I fully intend to use that option to send a student or a postdoc to a collaborator's lab to help finish up experiments. That, that's a wonderful uh, little uh, thing in the program. The other thing are these wonderful uh, courses that you would never otherwise attend, which would be things like uh, career management, leadership, mentoring, those kind of things that are beautifully put together. So I hope to be able to attend some of those kind of courses. And, um, you know, I will say that the small but flexible money Embo gives is, is wonderful for many things. So uh, just like Jyoti right now, I'm using some of our uh, uh, funds from Embo to support a PhD student who is supposed to finish a PhD but the five-year fellowship has run out. And of course, as you know, none of our agencies have given extensions on fellowships, even despite COVID. So this gives her funding for three to six months to wrap up her thesis and give it up. So that's really all I wanted to say. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll be very, very happy to take any kind of open questions that you can answer. Uh, thank you, Shunil. With that, I think we can move on to the question section. Uh, over to you, Shantana. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, Gurland, uh, for all of your insights. So just uh, a quick, I want to remind everybody that do put, I mean, I, a lot of questions have been coming in. So thank you for that. But do put in any other, any more questions that you have. And if you want to ask your question in person, um, you can press the virtual raise hand icon and then we will invite you to ask your question. So I'm just going to start. And so one of the questions I had that, um, okay, so let me just pick up the questions that have come in. Uh, so one of the questions is um, regarding independent fellowships in India. So the Ramanujam, Ramalinga Swami, and we've got this question in a few different flavors. Um, so people with independent fellowships in India with the required experience, are they eligible to apply for the GIN program? Yes. Right. Yes, of course. Of course, I mean, in particular, that was also one of the questions that uh, I had already answered to. Um, we are not giving a grant to run the lab. So basically what you're getting from EMBO is the extra. It is, it is the networking, it's the extra little funds that actually help your lab and you um, to, to prosper. But it is not the basic funding that you need. So hence, you know, having a Rama Lama, Rama, <laughs> I used to be able to say that. <laughs> and if, to have any of these fellowships and also India Alliance fellowships is, of course, uh, necessary and in particular also a good advertisement for yourself, right? As they are being very prestigious uh, fellowships. Thank you. Um, so, one question um, that um, Jut the one question that was for Jyoti, but I guess any of you can answer it is, can you elaborate a little bit what you mean by sufficient funding? Because early grants, the early grants that young investigators get in India, depending on where they have a position, um, can be very limited. Yeah, as you get, get, get Lynn told, Yanbo uh, Jin is not to run your lab. So you should have enough, uh, whether it is Ramalinga Swami, whether it is Welcome Trust for biomedical research, for plant biology, unfortunately, we don't have many, but whatever ECR, whatever grants you can, you have before, you should be relatively well-funded that you can run a very good research program and you are able to publish your work. Uh, the main thing is you have a good research profile, you are able, your, your lab is doing good, has, is doing good work, is publishing, and now you want to, uh, you know, take it a step further. So whatever enables it, your institutional grant. Or uh, I'll just add one point here, if, if I may. Um, yeah, really the, the, the gin is nice because it is, you apply for it about five years after you start your lab, five, six years. Uh, so... In India, we know the early time scales are very slow. First year, second year, nothing much happens. But it definitely gives you enough time to get at least two uh, small, medium-sized grants. You know, the SERB early career or uh, SERB core grant. One of those you will get in the five years that you've started your lab. So by the time you apply for this, you will have independent funding. I think that timeline is very important. It makes sense for us in India. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd have to add to that that we uh, set that timeline in, you know, when we discuss with uh, EMBO members and scientists in India, also younger scientists, to find out what would be a, a good timeline to to set between, you know, not being a young starting group group leader and but on the other hand also being able to set up a, a meaningful full lab under the local circumstances. So that's how we got to the six years. Yeah, that's a good point to highlight in terms of Jin and Yip, the, one of the, the yeah. distinguishing factors. So we will, um, we will invite Yogesh to ask a question in person. But before that, I'm just going to sneak in a question that came in last time as well, Gerlin, during the, during the EMBO webinars. And that was related to themes. So I think just a, it's a broad question on what kind of research can people put forward um, for EMBO funding. And so the question is, does EMBO fund biomedical or bioengineering type of research, but at a more broad level, is there a kind of umbrella under which your research should fall? Yes, so, so yes, the answer is yes, biomedical and also bioengineering, but it has to have a molecular component. So it must be clear, that's a, you know, there must be a clear mechanism that is being explored. Right, so just statistical analysis of um, you know whatever cases, etc., and inference of how whatever substance uh, affects cells is not going to be enough. So there has to be a molecular mechanism behind the work that you're presenting. Hello. Uh, maybe you can just wait. Are you? Um, is there anything else you wanted to tag on to that answer, Gerlin? Um. No, I hope I hope that is that makes it clear that um, there has to be yeah a molecular uh, yeah. mechanism behind what you're exploring. I think that and, and you you must be exploring them. Obviously, there always is a molecular mechanism behind what you're exploring, but you must be exploring that. Sorry, yes. Uh, so Yogesh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Keep. Uh, I just request you to keep it short and precise. Yeah. Uh... I'm Yogesh from Banar Sindhu University, uh, India, and greetings to all of you. Uh, I have a very uh, fundamental question. Question number one, while making the publication list, should we mention the impact factors? No. 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 Uh, second thing is that my impression is that I was looking at most of the awardee, which is getting the uh, GIN program, and except the Jyoti, mostly they belong from the animal sciences. So I had a question in my mind that it do not uh, means discriminate the plant science and animal science. It only look at what your vision and how is going to impact the Europe and India, if I, if I understand uh, properly. Um, it is it is about you presenting exciting science. It really doesn't. It could be totally exotic in the sense of you know you cannot see any downstream application for it. That is not important for the committee. For the committee, it's important that you have an exciting question, you're an interesting question, and you can you can show them that you burn for this question and and that you know that that it is going to advance our understanding of science in a meaningful way. I'll add that I don't work with plants or animals. I work with uh, microbes, mostly fungi. So, Thanks, Anil. Thanks, Kalan. Um, now we'll take a another live question. So, Shravanti, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, I'm Shravanti from uh, CCMB Hyderabad. And I have two quick questions to ask. So can uh, the funding be utilized by the PI herself if she wants to get trained or, you know? Yes. Yes, of course. It's for you or your lab, you decide. Shravanti, are you there? Yes, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, did you, could you get hear the answer? Yes, I could. Okay. I could. So the lab as such can utilize it. It could be the PI or the students, right? And another question is, is there flexibility in the utilization of the funds? Uh, generally in India, fundings come under certain heads. So is there flexibility? Utilize it for all the needs which are, you know, given by IMBO? Or do you have specific heads, allocations for the fund? No, there is great flexibility. 
So what we request is that you, so we have, obviously we have a list of things that you can, you know, that we've been asked to do for, so that you can use this for, but if you have anything special or anything else that you would like to use the funds for, and we would just like to receive a request from you, and normally that is then agreed. So and we actually look forward to hearing from you how you would like to use the funds because that always gives us inspiration as to, you know, what other kind of activities and what other kind of help and, and support uh, young scientists need. Thanks, Kellen. So I'll take, I'll put forward one more question um, from the question and answer box. And so this is, um, Maybe Sunil or Jyoti, you could answer this. So this is regarding the timeline that you kind of adopted when you were putting together your application for the GIN program. And then if I could tag on to that question as well, since we are now about a month away from the deadline, um, what, what, would you, what would be your advice for people who are already kind of started working on their application? How should they use this last one month to possibly refine and polish their applications? Jyoti, would you like to start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in this last one month, I would tell you first to tell your referees. I mean, I had um, I had to you know remind them many times to to send the reference. I think it's an online link and it's not this you know something scan that you have to send. So they have to do it themselves. So I think that's the first thing: activate them and uh, make sure that your references are sent. And uh, if uh, you know, you, you're, as I said before, for me, it's, I feel it's the research vision, which has to be very well written. And since it's very uh, two pages, uh, make, make the most of it and uh, try to bring in that what, what do you really gain from this collaboration, uh, you know, from such, a, from such a fellowship, what are you aiming to gain? This should be very clear. I think Sunil, you can go. Yeah, I think the real focus of the application is where all do you see your re uh, research going and the entire breadth or spectrum that you have envisaged. So uh, two things, it's a very short proposal. So work on being succinct, don't ramble all over the place. That's really key. And then summarize your current research, but transition that to how that enables your, you to achieve your vision. I think uh, vision, can be all over the place if you don't show how your current work leads you to that future. But it's all about that. And again, same thing about references. You you do the references first. You can write the fellowship much later, but always a challenge. Yeah. I also want to add in this point that I had a collaboration with my postdoc supervisor, and one of the one of the sections there is you have to justify why you still you know have that uh, or a publication where you have their names. If you can really give a very good uh, reason for it. in my case, for example, we were measuring some specific metabolites, and this this facility was not available in my institute or around, and uh, I had an independent international grant with them, the Max Planck India Partner Group. And I, hence I collaborated with them. So this, you know, I still maintain the collaboration. So I, I wrote it in my, you know, uh, there was a, a place where we had to write it. And maybe you can also include, they are genuine things. It's, it's not something. And during the, your interview, they will gauge you whether you are, you know, independent from your supervisor or not. Don't worry about it too much. Yeah. I mean, that is just, I mean, Jyoti just said it. It is about, it's not about you know, wanting to cut links between you and your former supervisor, not at all. It is about uh, uh, scientific independence, intellectual independence. And this is what the, the committee would like to find out. So first by making you justify why you are still collaborating with them and then they will test that uh, in the interview. So maybe um, once again, if any of you want to ask your questions, you can raise your hand. And so I'll take another question that's come in. And that is, um, this also touches upon something that Dimple Natani told us in the article that we did with her, which is what is the kind of institutional support that you can draw upon while putting together your application, institutional or scientific community support. And so one of the things she mentioned was that in the kind of last mile to her application, she circulated it to trusted peers, mentors, to get this kind of second set of eyes to read it. So you could, you know, as, um, Sunil was saying to keep it succinct and not ramble on. So is this something that 
uh, Sunil and uh, Jyoti, either of you did? Um, did you or did you just leave your application aside for a while, kind of go to it again with a fresh, with a fresh mindset? Um, so I did talk? not do it. Uh, I, I, you know, I I did not pass it on to anyone. So yeah. I, in general, I have a bunch of friends all over the place, not just in my institute who read everything I write and vice versa. So I always find it useful to have somebody else look at anything I write because, you know, you write something a certain way and somebody else reads and understands it a certain way. I would strongly recommend that, especially if you have, I mean, everybody will have some friends or mentors who are able to read and comment on it. I would recommend that uh, very strongly. Uh, but also this other point that you mentioned, institutional support, you know, when you present your uh, proposal, I think you can highlight what strengths your institutes have. But the other thing, because we all know, I mean, systems are not always perfect in institutes in India. Uh, if you can have a few lines on how you already envision some connections or collaborations elsewhere to help you jump those hoops, that I think strengthens your application a lot. Yes, it does. So one question, uh, thanks Anil, thanks Jyoti. One question in terms of just applying is, um, are you eligible to apply for Embo Jin and Embo Yip? In, can you submit an application for Embo Jin and Embo Yip in the same year? I mean, I'm assuming this person is within the cutoff for Embo Yip. Uh, so yes. in that case. Yes, that is up? possible. That is possible. And um, the, usually the, uh, but you cannot be, well, yes, you can be both at the same time. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling now. So we've had a case where somebody was first a gym and then became a yip. Um, I don't think we would allow somebody to be uh, a yip and then become a gym. I, yeah, we haven't really. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so the answer is yes, you can apply for them both if you're eligible, if you meet eligibility criteria. Um, so Veda Krishnan asked, and I think Gurlind, you answered this in the Q&A box, but just in case uh, people haven't seen that answer, you answered a similar question. And the question is in the current situation where we're almost away for two years from the bench, will there be any relaxation in upcoming calls, like a period relaxation? And I think the question in the chat box is also along the lines of, since the people, their research output has possibly dropped, can review articles yeah. also be considered? So basically, what are the considerations mm -hmm. given that people have had um, kind of a break from being able to work in the lab? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, I, as I wrote, um, this has been obviously discussed with the committee when they met in October and November last year. Of course, we did not, some, somehow, you know, optimistically, as everybody is, uh, it was not expected that it would drag out for so long. And we'd have, so basically, I think we will definitely revisit that topic. On the other hand, of course, and that is not changing, that everybody's in the same boat. So there's no one who's just going to pass you because, uh, you know, the situation is any different for them. That's not the case, right? It's pretty much everywhere on this planet where, where things have slowed down. So the question is what, you know, who would we be advantaging or disadvantaging by this? Because we are all in, this, in, a, in a similar situation. Um, one might want to think that in the long run, one would say in a couple of years, okay, you can have been, well, we'd have to think about that. So, so those are the two things that we need to weigh off, right? Um, everybody's in the same boat, so, hmm. uh, On the other hand, you know, would we allow an additional year in you yeah, but for how long so how for how long would you allow an additional year you know imagine the year for five years and the young uh, and the global investigator program for seven years for how long i mean when you know do you do it for the next seven years right because because at any point in time you might have been hit by the by the pandemic so these are the the, the, the thoughts uh, i mean if anybody has uh, some smart insights i'd be happy to hear them right <laughs> And, and, and argue problem, yeah. 
Thanks, Colin. And so one question, which I think is a, a quick clarification, I think this has already been mentioned is, um, the best three publications that you mentioned that should be part of the application, that is what you should have published when you are an independent PI, or could it be your publications from your postdoc as well? Okay. Anybody can answer this. Uh, in my case, they were all publications from my research group, not my postdoc or student work. I don't think the rule, uh, the rule says anything about which three you consider your best. But I definitely feel I'm better now as a PI than I was as a student postdoc. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, but you know, one little point here, uh, they don't care about the impact factor as such. They look at what you've done and how you explain why you think it's your best publication. Uh, so, <clears throat> and that's why you're only allowed to put three in and not 20, even if you have 20. So you have to put in only three, you have to pick and choose and why it's your best becomes important. Yeah. And it, it is, sorry, Jyoti. No, no, please go ahead. It, what we see is a mix. You know, some people just take their own lab papers, but I see a lot of uh, papers from the PhD. And what I do see, and that is not, not good, is that people you know, sometimes prefer to take a, a, a paper from one of those uh, three letter or five letter journals. Um, even though they are maybe a middle author or something, that is not a good idea. The committee does not care for impact factors with signatory of DORA. They care for, as Tsunyu was saying, that this is exciting work where you made an important contribution. And that's not necessarily in any of these short name journals. Yeah, for, uh, for me, the three papers, only one was from my independent lab. I chose my three papers based on the mechanism that I'm trying to answer, with, uh, which was this calcium uh, in, uh, you know, channels. And I chose this paper on that line. So I, one from my lab and uh, uh, two from my lab, sorry. And one was my PhD work that introduced me to the field. I also wrote it down, you know, that's what attracted to me the, uh, to this field. And it's my first foray into calcium signaling. So it can be mixed. I mean, it's you, for you to decide what line you want to take and what is your research vision. Thanks, I think uh, I but probably have... not don't show up. <laughs> it has to it has to look like it falls into a mm -hmm. I think that's a good point that it should kind of build to whatever you're proposing that you want to do. Okay. So we have um Jaskiran. Jaskiran, do you want to ask your question in person? You have been given permission to talk. So I think we'll just go out for another five or ten minutes and uh, we have gone through a, a majority of the questions. Just Kiran? Okay, if not, we'll allow Yogesh to ask the question again. Uh, Yogesh? Yeah, so I have a one question because I was reading uh, in the EMBO uh, gene program, research vision, research describe the research theme and future direction of your lab. But it does not mention anywhere that how you are going to collaborate with Europe are where the European help is needed. So my impression was that I have to simply write down what biological question I have to answer, irrespective of my training and uh, my European connection. So please make it clear, should I emphasize at the end that how this question is going to collaborate between India and Europe, or I should be very honest that these are my questions which I want to address in near future. So please make it clear. Yeah, Yogesh, I think it has to be your um, broad research theme. And uh, you don't, as I told you, you don't have to find people in Europe whom you want to collaborate it. This is your broad theme. You want to find an answer this, to this question. And I would use, you know, something like I want this uh, program to enable me to do that. So you don't have to really list anything there. Yeah, nowhere in the, anywhere in the fellowship or proposal or in the interview, will they be explicitly uh, concerned about specific collaborations in Europe or anything like that. That, in fact, you don't see that at all. In the whole process. It is really your scientific question and ideas. Yes, I would like it. to add. Okay. No, please. Uh, in my interview, they did ask me, uh, you know, which groups 
uh, in Europe, uh, though I didn't put it in the research vision. So a few groups in Europe, which I would look to collaborate in. So, I mean, it's not, it, when you don't write it down, it doesn't mean that you don't have an idea. You might have two, three labs, which you would like, to, which will help you in this research vision so that you can prepare for that in further interview. Yeah, Jerry. Um, actually, um, the program is not really there to support uh, already ongoing collaborations. It's about making new connections. So it really does not matter if you already have or don't have, in fact, uh, uh, any cooperations. But I mean, this is what the program is about. You may, if you want to, uh, you may get some, right? And maybe that's even more successful if we can can get new people and new connections started rather than you know building on on connections that have been there already. So don't worry about that point. Thanks, Galen. So I think we have gone through all the questions that have come in, and I but I think the last point was really a point that is worth reiterating multiple times that what is the purpose of the gins and the yips? It's not to give you sufficient funds, as has been said, to run your, your, all of your research needs, but to really help you advance and build kind of your re scientific research career through networking, to interactions, through um, all of these opportunities. So before we wind, if anybody has a question, they can raise their hands. But before we kind of sign off for the day, is there anything? Can I, can in... I add uh, something? Yes, I just please. looked at one of the Q&As. Last mm -hmm. question is if the paper is not yet published but submitted, does that count? I just want to say, I'm throwing it out here, put everything as a P print on bioarchive. <laughs> just a generally good habit. I mean, personally, I, I, I strongly believe in putting stuff out there. So put it on bioarchive. If it's on bioarchive, it will definitely count. Yeah. It, and it, it does count in so far as um, you have basically until the day of the interview mm -hmm. to then tell the committee it's there. Mm -hmm. my paper is there so they they may select you because they think uh, you know it's interesting what you're proposing you've described the paper in your work and basically you you have until the day of the of the interview to prove that actually we've had somebody who's you know two days later has had their paper published and then you know it still went through so um and of course uh, you know like zuni was saying it's always a good idea to to publish on bioarchive right so Dimple had a Dimple Notani had quite a kind of almost like um, like a like a dramatic story where her paper got accepted. I think while she was sitting, um, waiting for her interview at Heidelberg, while she was waiting for that to happen, she got the acceptance of one of her publications. So, so yeah, as long as it happens by the interview, um, is there anything else any of you would like to add? Any any last messages? before we sign off. Just uh, looking forward to receiving good applications from India so that we have a strong future group joining, joining the Global Investigator Network in India. Thanks a lot, Galen. Thanks a lot, Sunil Jyoti. I will yeah. now hand it back to Suchi to um, wrap up the webinar. Thank you, Shantala. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for moderating the question and answer session. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Galin for joining us today uh, for this talk, for this webinar. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, Sunil and Jyoti. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experience and, and sharing the minute details, you know, how you prepared your application and what to do, what not to do. I'm sure the participants or uh, uh, the attendees we had today are uh, very much in profit <laughs> by listening to your talks and experiences. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, more such uh, discussions between AMBO and uh, uh, India Bioscience. And we'd uh, love to have you again in uh, our webinars. And thank you to all the attendees who have joined us today for our session. Hope you can apply for AMBO in now and hope uh, all of you uh, receive a fair chance of getting the uh, fellowship. And uh, thanks to Shantala uh, for moderating it. Thanks to Jile for uh, arranging everything, all the uh, links and everything related to the webinar. 
And that's all for today. Uh, see you again later. Thank you. Thank you. I'm ending the uh, webinar now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, Kachi. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Elaine.